Welcome, my sisters and brothers, to this, the homily for the 23rd Sunday in Ordinary Time. And we continue with Mark's Gospel, but unfortunately, yet again, we've jumped over a chunk. You remember last time we left Jesus having engaged in debate with uh, the scribes and Pharisees who'd come down from Jerusalem to inspect, as it were, his re-evangelization of the northern part uh, of Israel, the part where there had been a mixture between the people of Israel and the kings uh, of the pagans whom Joshua had not thrown out. We were seeing how the real Joshua was here and how he was giving uh, a definitive interpretation of the law and rather holding back the more restrictive account of the law that the scribes and Pharisees wanted to impose as part of their new evangelization. He was, if you like, going back to first principles in a much freer way. Um, He then moves on. This is still part of his visitation of the North. And the first thing that happens, and the reason I'm going to talk about this is because it's important for our second passage, is he goes and hides out in the region of Tyre. the northern part of uh, uh, of Israel by the by the sea, he enters a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not. The translation gives uh, is escape notice, but in Greek it says hide. Uh, and there's a little hint here. Truly, O God of Israel, thou art a hidden God, and yet the one who is coming in can't even hide. So that's uh, an important little hint of what's going to go on. And then we're going to have two different uh, castings out of demons. Not healings, strictly speaking, but because in both cases it's a demon that's involved. And the two, one is the Syrophoenician woman and her daughter, and the other is the man with uh, an impediment in his speech, the deaf man with an impediment in his speech. They've got, they're both strictly parallel to things that happened earlier amongst Jewish people. Uh, so it's worth following that, that there's something strict going on here. You remember uh, that when so the woman who has little daughter has an unclean spirit, immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Now we're going to get uh, that, that healing is going to be done, and I'll follow that in a second. But I just want you to remember two... Uh, women curings that happened before the feeding of the 5,000. The first was the woman with uh, a, f- a, f- a flux of blood, the woman who was bleeding, um, who she comes and touches Jesus' uh, cloak, the hem of his cloak, as it were, um, clandestinely to get him to work a miracle while he's on the way to cure a little girl. And he turns around and cures her, uh, recognizes that she has been cured by him, tells her that her faith is strong, and then he goes to the house of the little girl, using his cure of of her to give faith to the uh, synagogue uh, director, the synagogue official whose little daughter is ill. And then when they find her, they find her laid out on a bed, as if a corpse, but he tells her to get up. But So here we have that but as a two-in-one, it's the woman whose little daughter has an unclean spirit, which usually means that there's something wrong between the two of them. And he says to her, in a provocative way, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. So here, the Lord, the God of Israel, has come amongst his own, and he's saying to her, don't let the little dogs... Um, uh, you know, I'm not going like, to give the little dogs food first. And she replies to him, and this is the beautiful reply, she basically quotes the psalm of David, Psalm 17, the last verses, say, so even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Basically, she's quoting uh, a psalm to him, which says, um, May their bellies be filled with what you have stored up for them. May their children have more than enough. May they leave something over to their little ones. So basically, she's 
addressing him as if he were the son of David. And the verse after that says, As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied beholding your likeness. Okay, so she's got very strong faith. She knows she's talking to the son of David. She quotes David at him. And he says to her, not, as our translations say, for saying that you may go, but on account of this word you may go, the demon has left your daughter. On account of this word. In other words, because you have quoted David to me, the son of David, knowing what you're doing, done. Um, so she went home and found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. So uh, we get the lying on the bed, but the demon gone. Uh, so the two miracles of the hemorrhoid woman and Jairus' daughter, whoop, in one go, and the Syrophoenician woman and her daughter in one go. Uh, we're getting, if you like, the pagan version uh, happening at the same time. And this is uh, a double uh, act of healing that we're going to see now as we have the parallel. And the parallel here was with the paralytic man whose friends carried him in and uh, lowered him through the roof so that brought him in so that Jesus could uh, could heal him. So, now we come to today's Gospel. Then he returned from the region of Tyre. So he's coming back into the purely... Uh, he's coming back into Israel and a mixed group where it's not clear who's pagan and who's Gentile. And went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. So he's heading for the Galilee... Uh, a Jewish reason, but he's in the region of the Decapolis. The Decapolis, if you remember, was where the um, Gadarene demoniac, whom he had healed, uh, whom he had cured earlier in the Gospel, had gone around preaching after he had been set free. He went around telling everybody what wonderful things the Lord had done for him so that people were amazed. And so the people in that region, presumably they've heard of him, Perhaps this is part of the spillover from the the, the healing, the, the preaching of the uh, former Gadarene demoniac. So they brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. Now please notice the request to lay his hand on him, which was the same as Jairus' request concerning his, his daughter, uh, presupposed that the problem was a problem of possession. That was the kind of touch that you did for a possessed person. They weren't saying this is a person who is sick. They were saying this is a person who is possessed. And Jesus' activity here is curious. Uh, there are many mysteries in this passage, very many very subtle mysteries, and I bet you I haven't caught all of them, but I'm going to try and catch some. So he takes him away aside, in private, away from the crowd. So the suggestion that there is something evil uh, that that goes on in the crowd, there is something, if you like, about crowd contagion that keeps spirits like this going. There's something about this person's relationship to the crowd that is going to be key to his being brought to life. He is, a, as we all are, a thoroughly mimetic person. And if you live in a mixed world with some holiness, like in Israel, but also some uh, demons, uh, like in this part of the town, then there's going to be a mixture of things wrong with you. So he takes him away in private, away from the crowd, and he puts his fingers into his ears. And he spat and touched his tongue. It doesn't say, notice, it doesn't say he spat on his fingers and touched his tongue. It's slightly, the three uses of spat in the New Testament, but the first here, the second Later in Mark, where he spits on a person's eyes. And the third in John, where he spits on the ground to make clay, to rub in uh, the man's eyes. In each case, the use of spitting is slightly different. So, puts his finger into his ears. Um, and what's going on here? Um, close, your, close your ears from hearing of bloodshed. This is from, uh, from Isaiah. I hope I've got that right. Um, Yes, it is closing your ears from hearing uh, of bloodshed. Um, so, and, and uh, your mouth from, uh, from I forget what, what the term is, from the mouth, closing your ears of hearing of bloodshed. Um, he's, he's actually 
apparently, if you like, that doesn't sound as though he's opening the ears. He's shutting out what comes from outside, from the crowd, uh, the evil, and the tongue he's going to touch. Uh, but first of all, he spits. Uh, this appears to be, uh, um, how would you say, a ritual, a ritual thing. There's a very odd passage in uh, the book of Numbers where Moses asks for Miriam, his, sis his uh, sister, who has been um, given leprosy because of her uh, challenging who got to speak on behalf of the Lord. And the Lord says to Moses, even if her father had spit in her face, the spit at her, uh, she would still have to go out for seven weeks for impurity. In other words, there's the suggestion that spitting is a expulsive gesture. So he's spitting, and that's part of the, the rite, the exorcism rite, is spitting out the devil and touches his tongue. It says uh, in um, uh, the Book of Wisdom that the uh, if you blow on a flame, uh, you put it out. If you spit on it, it puts. Uh, if you sp if you blow on a flame, it's uh, it, uh, a spark. It'll grow into a flame. If you spit on it, it'll put it out. Uh, so here it is, putting it out, touching the tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighs and says to him, "Ephphatha," that is, be opened. Okay, well, we have this rather odd and rather beautiful enactment of a quote from the book of Job here. And I'm going to take a little time with this because it's very beautiful and it shows something of how people would read a passage like that in, uh, in times past. You see, there's a beautiful passage in Job that I'm going to read as well as I can to you. Um, and it says, this is Job 9, 27 to 35. It says, and if I should say, I will forget to speak, bowing down to the face, I will groan. I quake in all my limbs, for I know that thou wilt not leave me alone as innocent. But since I am ungodly, why have I not died? For if I should wash myself with snow and purge myself with pure hands, thou hast thoroughly plunged me in filth, and my garment had abhorred me. For thou art not man like me, with whom I could contend that we might come together to judgment. Would that he, our mediator, were present, and a reprover, and one who should hear the cause between both. Let him remove his rod from me, and let not his fear terrify me. So shall I not be afraid, but I will speak, for I am not thus conscious of guilt. So you have here the plea, as it were, of the demonized man put into the mouth of Job. But here we have present the Redeemer, the Mediator, who is going to touch him, who is, uh, in, the, in the words of this thing, who bend, bends down to his face, not that one, but this one is going to look up to heaven and groan, because he's the Mediator, and then touch his face, and he's going to be able to speak. So we have Jesus being the mediator, but not as one of vengeance, uh, as one who is doing, in a sense, the reverse of what is talked about in Job, but as the mediator, he's enabling the person to speak. It's a, it's a beautiful little enactment that we're getting here in, uh, in Mark's Gospel. And he says to him then, Ephthatha, be opened. This is probably from, uh, from Hebrew rather than from Aramaic, uh, because that, that is a verb in Hebrew. Uh, and immediately his tongue, immediately his ears were opened and his tongue was released. As it said, the block was released and he spoke plainly. Again, this is a beautiful uh, thing. So let's remember, what is it that has ears but cannot hear and a tongue but cannot speak? Well, it's an idol. Jesus is in idol territory. Psalm, uh, uh, 135 has the famous quote about with ears they cannot hear, with tongue they cannot speak. So here is someone who in pagan territory is semi-idolized, semi-turned into idol, and how he's being brought to life, brought to the possibility of speaking. Um, 
and his tongue was loosened. It said the block was undone. Uh, and it's the, the, it's the loosing of the block. So it's the same word as binding and loosing. Jesus is enacting even before uh, the power is given to the authorities, the binding and the loosing. Here he is binding the evil one and loosing the tongue. What does this mean? That whereas when he'd been doing the same amongst the people of Israel, it was talking about sins being forgiven and faith. Here it's about driving out demons because they're half demonized, but bringing to life because that's what undoing demons does. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and it says, and he spoke plainly. It's the word orthos. It's a beautiful little hint. Because uh, in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, this is chapter 18, the Lord speaks uh, to Moses, who uh, tells him that the people are right. They speak rightly to him. They speak aright, orthos. And then he says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. In other words, this semi-idol who has been brought to life bears witness to the fact that this is the prophet whom God had promised to Moses. And of course, the voice starts to run around and the people speak um, with uh, with more abundance than Jesus uh, would like at this moment. He orders them not to tell people about it. And I'm honestly not sure why that. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. Maybe that was, uh, maybe that was his intent. I don't know. They were astounded beyond measure. So this is the fulfillment of the Isaiahic prophecies about the wilderness bursting into, into life, into flower, into song, into dance at the arrival of the Lord. The one who is hidden is coming into their midst. He has done everything well. They don't realize it, but they're announcing that the one who has done everything well, the one who made all things and saw that they were good, the creator is alive. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. In other words, idols... Uh, a thing of the past. Humans who are bound down to idols are being turned into daughters and sons of God. And so Jesus continues with his more than Joshua, greater than Moses, the Lord coming into the midst of his people to reveal who he is. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.